The first principle that we can deduce logically from our decision to say that we think there are people out there who are behaving purposefully or acting, and, and that word action, that's the term that the like, Austrian economist Ludwig von Mises used for this idea. So for the rest of this lecture, I'm going to frequently be coming back and just using that word, that concept, because that is summarizing everything that we're starting with in the beginning of our assumptions here, or our, uh, it's, our, it's our initial axiom, if you will, is human action. And that's actually the title of Mises' famous book, where he summarized his whole worldview, basically. It's his book was titled Human Action, a treatise on economics. Okay, so throughout this lecture, when I say action, what I mean is purposeful behavior. So remember, when you see a rock slide, that's not action. You wouldn't say, oh, the reason those boulders are moving down the hill is that they must want to get lower. Like maybe they are afraid of something up at the top, or maybe they're thirsty and want to get a drink from the stream down here. No, that language would be nonsensical because the boulder is not alive. It doesn't have thoughts or feelings or motivations. But it makes perfect sense if you see a group of people running down a hill to interpret that observation that you're making and say, huh, it looks like they're, they want to get down the hill. So that's the first thing to say about the situation. I'm observing this and the way I make sense of my sensory observations is to say those people are trying to get down the hill and then I can speculate and say why? Well, I don't know, maybe there's a mountain lion up there or maybe they're really thirsty and there's a stream down here and so they're running down to get a drink. Who knows? But notice in the social sciences it is entirely appropriate to use the idea of intentionality, of assuming there are things out there that are conscious and have goals and desires and that's the way we start explaining our observations in the social sciences. So that kind of talk would be crazy and unscientific in the natural sciences. In the social sciences, not only is it scientific, it's essential. So it's, it's not merely permissible. You have to talk like that. Otherwise, you would get nowhere in the social sciences if you didn't start with the idea that there are beings out there who have their own motivations and desires and are trying to influence the course of history to steer it in the way that they prefer. Okay, so what I'm saying is our decision to say there is action out there in the world, one of the things we can conclude is, well, there must be actors. I don't mean Hollywood actors. I don't mean people who get paid to play characters. I'm saying an actor in the sense of a being who engages in action. Okay. What, or another way of putting it, I think I put it in the textbook, is to say there must be individuals who do the acting. And that might sound obvious and trivial, but it's important to make that point because a lot of times we can be led astray in our everyday language when we lose sight of the fact that if you're going to be looking at purposeful behavior, at action, that means there must be some individual responsible for it. There must be some agent carrying out the action. And you have to keep that in mind or else you're going to run into trouble. So for example, uh, sometimes people will say something like, you know, the U.S. government is crazy. It, 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 it contradicts itself because on the one hand, it gives subsidies to tobacco farmers. And on the other hand, it gives money to ad agencies to come up with anti-smoking commercials aimed at young people and so on. So that doesn't make any sense. Why is the government subsidizing tobacco and then at the same time subsidizing people to not buy products that use tobacco? It seems like it's a contradiction. And one thing that's wrong with that type of statement is the U.S. government is not an actor. The U.S. government per se actually doesn't make decisions. Really, there, it's an institution and there are lots of individuals who interact through these various power structures that we have in our current society, but ultimately there is no such acting entity uh, as the U.S. government that makes decisions. There are people involved who may do things in the name of the U.S. government, and that might be how they get so many other people to listen to what they have to say, is they'll say, hey, I represent the U.S. government, or I'm taking these actions on behalf of the government, and, and that resonates with certain people in a certain way. 
Okay, but ultimately, the things we see people doing are the result of individual choices and actions. There is no such thing as the U.S. government that acts in the way that people act. So to say the U.S. government is acting would be like saying, oh, the reason that boulder's falling down the hill is that it, it's scared of the, of the mountain lion at the top, or it's thirsty. That that language doesn't make sense. By the same token, the U.S. government per se is not something that has preferences and goals and reason. The individuals who are employed by it or who work with it and so forth and try to influence what's called government policy, those people are all acting beings. And so to really understand and diagnose what's going on and understand reality, you have to always keep in mind that when you're talking about action, specify who is the actual actor in this situation responsible for what seems to be purposeful behavior. The next principle we're going to go over is the insight that individuals have preferences. So here the idea is, okay, we've already established if we're going to see action out there in the world, if we're committed to saying as a social scientist, I'm going to interpret my observations through the lens of action and that's what I'm seeing out there is action. We've already established, well, there must be actors. There's at least one individual outside of myself causing what I'm classifying as action. There has to be. It wouldn't make sense to see action but not think there was an actor, okay? But now what I'm saying is that we can, we can do more than that. We can say this actor, this individual who is performing the action must have preferences and that's the fancy economist term for what these things are. A, mo a more common everyday l term might be goals or purposes or objectives. And it's on the one hand it's a very simple insight and on the other hand it's it's subtle and that's why I'm bringing it up but notice this is not something we, we measure or empirically capture. It follows necessarily from our decision to, to interpret what's going on as action. So let's go back to the rock slide example. When we look at the rocks falling down the mountain and we say, well, we, we don't see action there. We try to explain it as physicists. And we just say, well, you know, there's certain mass and there's gravity and da da da. And it's not that the gravity's trying to do something. It's not that uh, the objects want to be closer together if they're massive and that they, the degree of their desire to be closer together is proportional to the mass and so forth. That's, that language doesn't make sense when we're looking at things that we might call inanimate. But when we see people running down the thing, down the hill, it's entirely appropriate to say that's action. There's individuals, individual actors. I'm, I'm seeing other minds at work here. It's not just me, I'm not the only mind, there must be other minds out there, otherwise it wouldn't be action. But then beyond that we say, if we're going to ex explain this and interpret it as action, they must have preferences, they must have goals. If we didn't think they had any goals, then it wouldn't make sense to classify this as action. So we've already talked about what the goals might be. It could be that they're running away from a mountain lion, it could be that they're thirsty, it could be that they had cell phones and they just got news that their relative was in a car accident and so they're running down to get back to their car to go back home and go to the hospital. All kinds of things. We don't know what the preferences are. We don't know what the goals or the purposes are, but my point is if you're going to commit to saying there is action here, then you are necessarily committed to saying more than that, to say there are individuals, other minds at work, and they have goals or purposes. And again, that follows from the initial axiom or assumption. It's not something that we then go validate empirically. If, there, if you're going to say there is action, then there have to be preferences going along with it. That's a logical deduction. Okay, so we've established if there's action, there's got to be an actor or an individual, another mind at work, and that actor or individual or other mind has preferences. So now I'm going to say something more we can go further and say those preferences are subjective, meaning they're tied to the particular individual or they're unique to the individual. 
there's no reason f that those preferences or goals or purposes have to be the same across individuals. And again, this just follows naturally that a preference or a goal, if it goes hand in hand with the fact that we're saying there's a mind at work and we're observing reality and saying, I perceive action here. That's the way I'm going to make sense of this. Well, then the preferences or goals that go along with that are tied to that particular individual. And if you see multiple examples of action that are tied to different individuals, well, then those preferences of themselves are associated with each individual. So that's what we mean when we say preferences are subjective. So in the context of economics, m more mundane standard economic topics, you'd say something like, well, as economists, if we want to explain prices in the marketplace, we want to say, hey, how come cigarettes have a certain price and how come broccoli has a certain price? The way we get off the ground with that is to say there are people out there who want to acquire cigarettes. They have a purpose. They have a goal to acquire packs of cigarettes and they're willing to hand over dollars for them or whatever the money is. And at the same time, there are other individuals, perhaps the same individuals, who also are willing to pay for broccoli. And that you have to understand that people have preferences and some people really enjoy getting cigarettes. Now we can go further and speculate and say because they get a buzz when they get nicotine into their system or they in social situations feel like they fit in better if they're smoking a cigarette, who knows what. I mean that there we're going beyond logical deductions and we're just speculating as to what the preferences might be. But the point is in order to get off the ground with our approach to explaining market prices, we need to assume or, or we, we, we know that people have subjective preferences if we're going to interpret those market prices as being the result of action. And there's no reason that those preferences have to be the same across individuals. That one person might really enjoy smoking and really be willing to pay a lot of money for a pack of cigarettes. Another person might not want to pay any money at all for cigarettes. And there's nothing weird about that. So uh, to, to put it a different way, a different example, we could say to one person, all right, here's a choice. You can choose vanilla ice cream or chocolate ice cream, which one? And the person chooses chocolate. So we would say, oh, the way we'd make sense of that is to say he prefers the chocolate over the vanilla. We could ask another person the same ch question, chocolate or vanilla, which do you prefer? And the person chooses the vanilla over the chocolate. And so their preferences are different and that's fine. There's no, nothing contradictory about that. In contrast, if we said uh, to the person, which of these has the most calories? Or which of these bowls of ice cream weighs the most? Then the person could give an answer that was either right or wrong. Because weight and caloric content is an objective fact or uh, property of physical objects. There is a fact of the matter irrespective of what people think about it. And so if one person said the vanilla, the bowl of vanilla is heavier than the bowl of chocolate and the other person said the opposite, at least one of them has to be wrong. Whereas if I say which of these is better or which of these bowls is preferable, it's perfectly fine for one person to give me one answer and the other person to give me a different answer. There's no contradiction. It's not that one of them is right and one of them is wrong. If when I say is preferable, all I mean is which would you choose? That, that's really all it means. In, in the context of economics, when we talk about preferences, all we mean is what people would choose if they had to between these two things. The one they would choose is the one that's preferred. Okay, so let me just address a possible misconception or misunderstanding. Remember, by talking like this, we as economists are not endorsing the preferences and we're not even being neutral and saying, hey man, anything goes, it's all relative, you, you value whatever you want, man, and, and I'm, not, I'm not here to judge you. We're not saying it in that respect. What we're just saying is, if you want us as economists to explain outcomes in the marketplace, you need to start with the fact that people have subjective preferences. 
and we, we don't that's not our business to evaluate them in that respect if what the task at hand is to explain market prices or other things that happen in the marketplace so again that doesn't mean that in general we're fine with no matter what preferences are or that economics teaches us hey you can't you can't have any opinion as to what other people's preferences are sure you can you can at the same time uh, think that smoking is awful and be contributing money to anti-smoking campaigns and tell your children hey if you if I ever catch you smoking I'm gonna kick you out of the house and as an economist when someone says why are the prices of cigarettes what they are and the price of pipes and and uh, bags of tobacco and rolling papers and all that stuff wh why are those prices what they are as the economist then I say oh well because people have preferences and some people very highly rank or get much enjoyment from obtaining these things even though I personally don't there's nothing there's no contradiction there so economics is still an objective science even though our current framework for explaining market prices is based on what's called subjective value theory so the objective science of economics explains things starting with the idea that there are people out there with subjective preferences.